Well, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Blavatnik School uh, this evening, and to welcome our very special guest, the Nobel Prize winning former president of Colombia, uh, Juan Manuel Santos. As you know, he was president of Colombia from 2010 until 2018, and in 2016 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work bringing to an end some 52 years of war in Colombia, which was estimated to have cost the country some $152 billion. I'm not going to tell you more about his life because that's what tonight's conversation is going to unearth. So I'd like also, well, so I'd like first to say a huge thank, a huge thank you for visiting us to President Santos and a huge welcome to President Santos. And then I would like to introduce the, the lady who's going to help uh, President Santos reveal all to us, and that's Sabina Alkir, who is a professor here at Oxford who works on international development. She's been working on this for a long time. Sabina runs an extraordinary project on multidimensional poverty, and this took her to work directly with President Santos while he was in power. And they've forged what is very clearly a fruitful intellectual and personal friendship, which you'll get to see um, this evening. Sabina brings more than just her academic expertise to this. Um, I hope you don't mind me introducing you also as an ordained priest in the Anglican Church who serves in one of the dioceses of Oxford and brings a blend of commitment to the scholarship with commitment to the cause of reducing poverty around the world. So Sabina, it's a special pleasure to have you here. Now I'm going to get off the stage and let them conduct this conversation, but I am going to jump back onto the stage in about um, 35 to 40 minutes so that we can ensure that you get to ask your questions of the President and of Professor Alkir. Over to you. Thank you so much, President, for being with us. Professor Santos, we are here in part out of admiration for your clear accomplishments, but we're also here in a school of government and with many other students and people across the university, and they may be admiring your accomplishments in part because they similarly would like to tackle head-on problems that are unthinkable or entrenched or intractable. So a question for you is what in your early career, in your studies or in your early positions helped you decide what to focus your energies on? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here with you and share some of my experiences. On a personal basis, uh, this uh, story started uh, many years ago when I was in the Colombian Navy. I was uh, uh, told by uh, an officer when I was a recruit in the Navy, uh, go and uh, learn how to sail. And he gave me a sailboat. And it was very difficult. And I didn't know what to do. And then he, he, he sat down with me and said, listen, uh, I'm going to teach you a lesson that will help you in the Navy, but it will help you in your life, uh, in your personal life, or if you have a company in your company, or even uh, if you have a country uh, in the country. You will always need somewhere to go. And you sail using the winds, even if they are against you. And no matter how difficult they are, uh, you can use them in your favor and get to the port of destination. I, I remember that lesson uh, from that time. I was, I was uh, 18 years old. And many years later, um, when I entered public life, I was
was given the responsibility of opening up the economy. Colombia was a very closed economy. That was in the early 90s. And uh, I was the first uh, foreign trade minister. And we needed to bring investment. And uh, we went with the then Minister of Finance to a big conference in New York with some of the potential investors, CEOs of the biggest companies, to attract them, to convince them to invest in Colombia. And we were in the middle of a conference like this one, and suddenly some news of a huge bomb in Colombia, in Bogota, in a commercial center, uh, arrived. Of course, all our strategy of selling Colombia in this conference simply failed. And one of the CEOs approached me and said, uh, Minister, your, your story about Colombia is very, very pretty, but as long as you have that war, you're, you will never get important investment. And uh, some months later, I was the, uh, as Minister of Trade, I was uh, elected as the chair of the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. And uh, I had to give the chair to Nelson Mandela. So I went to Johannesburg to give the chair to Mandela. We had a meet, uh, programmed a meeting of 15, 20 minutes. And that morning, I switched on the television. And I saw in live television the victims and the perpetrators uh, in, in the studios or in, in, in different parts, some of them em embracing each other, others shouting at each other. And I said, what a bizarre thing that I'm seeing here, and it was live. And so that afternoon, I asked Mandela, what is it that you're doing? And he started to explain to me uh, that this was a process uh, to heal the wounds of so many years of war in South Africa and started to explain to me uh, the process that he was in. Uh, this 15 minutes lasted more than four hours. And at the end, he said more or less what this uh, CEO had told me in New York some time before. But your country, which I know quite well, uh, it's a country with tremendous potential, will never take off if you don't finish that war. So at that moment, it sort of clicked, my port of destination and peace. And since then, I started uh, to study uh, how could we bring peace to Colombia. But that was a personal experience of, of, or uh, different personal experiences that uh, sort of gave me the vision of what should I work for as a priority. Yeah. A curiosity that I have is we first met uh, with James Foster, and you are an economist launching a, a multidimensional poverty measure. And the question that I have is, what did you see as being the political logic of reducing poverty? How did that come into this picture of, of trying to build the peace? When, when you get into government, and, uh, you, you, need, you need to sell a vision. Um, and my vision was peace, but not only peace. Uh, that is, uh, it's too limited. Uh, you have to have other objectives. And so I chose uh, poverty because Colombia was one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, and Latin America was one of the most unequal continents in the world. And poverty had been uh, uh, used even by the guerrillas as the reason for their uprising. And poverty also, and I'm an economist, uh, when, when you have high informality and a, a very big inequality, uh, that makes economic growth much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So to, to 
fight poverty and fight inequality uh, was uh, necessary. And also, if you want, at the end, sustainable peace in the long run, uh, you need to have a much more equitable country. So I chose poverty as one of, a, of the three priorities. And the third priority was education. Why education? Well, you all know better than I do, this is the most important investment that you can make uh, for any country. But education is also probably the most effective uh, social mobilizer. Uh, and if you give uh, every kid the same opportunity for a good education, the effect on poverty is, is huge. And therefore, the effect on a sustainable peace would be huge. So I chose those three, uh, peace, poverty, and education, as sort of the, the three pillars of my government. So naturally, so you're in power, you have the priorities, you have the objectives, but grand ideas are sweet soliloquies. So how did you engage other powers in the country? Uh, how did you get them to be motivated by your same vision and, and to work with you? We are in the school of government. Yeah. And um, <laughs> um, you need governability, the ability to govern. And what gives you governability? Well, if you're in a democracy, you need political support, you need Congress. So one of the first things I did when I got elected was to copy what Abraham Lincoln had done in the United States and with his obsession with uh, freeing the slaves the Emancipation Law. What did Abraham Lincoln do? He invited his former rivals to become part of the government. And in that way, he added different sectors of the Congress uh, to the government, and he, so he had enough governability with the Congress. I did exactly the same. Um, I won, uh, but I did not have a majority in Congress, and I asked my former rivals. I chose uh, one of the main issues of each. Listen, I will incorporate uh, your uh, proposal on employment of the Liberal Party and become my Minister of Labor. And I told another one, uh, you I will incorporate the, the idea you had about using the housing as an a engine for growth and come in to be Minister of Housing. And the agriculture, the, the, the other party, and become Minister of Agriculture. So I brought them into government, and I had a majority in Congress for uh, almost seven years, which allowed me to approve many of the laws uh, that, uh, and the reforms that uh, made peace possible mm -hmm. and that made the fight against poverty very effective because you need new institutions, you need reforms that have to be approved by Congress. So this is a basic element. You also need, uh, of course, public opinion. This is a, a constant uh, friction. Uh, you're, you're, in, in my case, uh, I was elected because I was very effective making war. I was a hawk. And suddenly I became a dove. And people did not understand that. I was warned that this would be, have a high, high political cost. Um, but uh, it was the only way to end the war. I could have continued, and many people, many of my advisors said, continue doing what you did. See how popular you, you were, uh, you are. I had more than 80% favorability, because making war 
if you're successful, if you win, is very, very attractive politically. You show you the trophies, uh, everybody applauds, and uh, everybody forgets about other problems, or at least uh, makes them less important. Making peace is another type of leadership. Uh, making war is a very vertical type of leadership. You give orders. Uh, you rally the forces around you. We are the good guys. The other guys are the bad guys. And it's a rather simple type of leadership. Making peace is more horizontal. Instead of giving orders, you have to persuade. You have to teach uh, people how to forgive. And to persuade uh, a mother whose daughter had been raped and killed to be, accept some uh, uh, benevolent treatment legally of the perpetrators is very difficult. So that was a permanent uh, uh, challenge of, of trying to explain, and, and not only in this case, always, public policies have to be explained and explained more than one time. Repeat, people don't understand until you explain them many, many times. And if you, you, if you do not explain them many times, or people don't understand your public policies, they will tend to reject them. It's very important for them to understand what you are doing. So you have to, uh, even if you think you have repeated yourself a thousand times, uh, when you think you're, you're being considered an idiot because you're saying things too much, the public is starting to understand or starting to, to get the, the message. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a, a permanent challenge. So governability also is, uh, in the case, for example, of the fight against poverty, is managing the different uh, ministries. Uh, ministers tend, there are political positions, they tend to be uh, very jealous of their, of their sort of uh, arena that they control. They don't like uh, uh, others to, to uh, take away part of their power. Um, and uh, when you have policies that are disruptive of the status quo, then you have to manage uh, the relations between the different ministries in order to be able, as a government, to be successful. Mm. Now that's a, such a rich answer because you've talked about consolidating power in the Congress or the judiciary, about communicating clearly for public opinion and um, management structures. Can you ground this in example? Give it, take an example through of how you um, implemented all of these. Well, um, for example, in order to, to create a favorable environment for the peace process, uh, there was a law that uh, was extremely uh, controversial and difficult to, uh, to pass my predecessor uh, had always rejected that law. And it's a law that allowed the government to uh, start repairing the victims without ending the war and start restituting the land to the peasants that were uh, displaced by the violence. Um, that law, uh, I had to, to work Congress very hard to have that approved. But it was so important to have that law approved that the Secretary General of the UN came to the signature of this law. And, uh, and that law gave even the international community and the guerrillas uh, a 
a positive warning that this peace process was serious and that the peace process was going in the right direction. Uh, this was, this was uh, a surprise for many, a positive surprise, and that opened a lot of windows or a lot of doors that would not have been opened without that law. I could mention many, many other laws that, that uh, were approved in, in terms of, for example, the poverty uh, to, to create, to, uh, I did something that was a bit uh, audacious. Um, I had poverty as a priority and I heard about, I, I had, I had Professor Amartya Sen as, a, as my teacher, twice, one in, at the London School of Economics and second time at Harvard. And I remembered his, his very innovative approach to fighting poverty. And so I said, I want to, I want to uh, try that approach. I, I, I thought in my, in my inside that this approach would be much more effective than the usual approach that had not, had not been that effective. So I called him and uh, I came to Oxford and we implemented the multi-dimensional index in Colombia. We were in the, as you know, Sabina, one of the pilot uh, countries that to implement it. For that, I needed to create a new institution. So I needed a, a law and I needed to re-accommodate uh, the budget. And that took money from different ministries and the ministers did not like that. So it's a process of convincing the, the, the government, my people, of the benefits of sharing and coordinating and sacrificing uh, for, the, uh, for a higher purpose. The same with the peace. In the case of poverty, I, I remember saying to many of the ministers, no, no, listen, this will benefit you. You, you give a bit of your budget to this, we, we, call, we call it the, de the Department of Social Prosperity, which managed the fight against poverty. Uh, he will improve your results because in this process, many more people will be uh, affiliated to the health system. So, and that will, will benefit you, I told the health minister, or the education system, I told the education minister. So it's a matter of, of uh, like uh, a director of an orchestra of coordinating the government to have a, a similar vision and not to uh, put traps one to each other, mm. which is very, very, uh, it, it's very common that ministers start to boycott other ministers, either because they want to show off or because uh, of political uh, infighting. Uh, so you have to be on top, uh, hands-on management to be able to uh, get these disruptive policies uh, in the correct direction and make them work. No, thank you so much. So looking outwards now, you were here in 2013 and you launched a South-South Network on Multidimensional Poverty, um, which now has 58 participating countries, and the newest country to follow Colombia's example in launching an MPI is Afghanistan, which of course faces problems of conflict as well as poverty. What kind of advice would you give uh, from your side that might be relevant there? Well, each conflict has uh, different conditions. There's no conflict that you can simply replicate. They are, in a way, common denominators. Um, for example, in the case of Colombia, one necessary condition to have a successful process was making peace with our neighbors. We were, at that time when I became president, without trade or even diplomatic relations with Venezuela or with Ecuador. Um, 
and both presidents did not like me at all. And I had to make a tremendous effort to seduce them in the sense of becoming my friends and helping me in the peace process uh, without giving in. in uh, ideologically, we were like water and oil, no, very different. And they did help me, and they were very important in the peace process. In today's world, uh, any negotiated solution of an asymmetrical war like the one in Afghanistan uh, needs the uh, support of the, of the neighbors. Um, and there you have some problems. You know, Pakistan and the rest of the neighbors, well, that's not so easy to get, but you need them. Mm. I did something that was extremely useful. I know that the uh, current Afghan president wants to try something similar. I um, appointed or chose uh, some foreign advisors who had hands-on experience in negotiations, who had been able to negotiate themselves in different conflicts. And I chose them very carefully. Uh, one of them was Shlomo Ben-Ami, who was the foreign minister of Israel, who was the architect of the Camp David Agreement. The other one was Jonathan Powell, chief of staff of Tony Blair, who was chief negotiator of, uh, uh, in, in the Northern Ireland uh, uh, peace process. Another one was uh, Joaquin Villalobos, who is now uh, here at, at, at Oxford, and I, I saw him here. Where is Joaquin? Uh, over there. Commander of the guerrillas, now at Oxford University. What a change, you know? And he was a chief negotiator in the Salvadorian peace process. Help me. Uh, Bill Uri, who was a professor of, of negotiation, theoretical, uh, he was a teacher. Anyway, they all brought in their experience, without any uh, uh, pre uh, prejudice or, or on the on the peace process, because they came from the outside, and they were extremely, extremely helpful. And I know that uh, one of my uh, one of the advisors, uh, William Uri, who works uh, at the Harvard University in the negotiation team, was in Afghanistan just uh, ten days ago because he wanted to know how this group uh, was uh, worked with me, and he wants to have something similar to uh, in Afghanistan. Um, you have to have another condition there, which is not very easy. Uh, it took some time in Colombia. You need the military balance of power in favor of the state. in this case the Taliban, think that they will win uh, the war, they will not negotiate a peace. They will not negotiate in good faith. Um, and I don't know, especially after Trump said that he was going to withdraw from Afghanistan, if the Taliban is going to be uh, in, uh, uh, ready to sit down and negotiate peace. So there are many things that are common, others that are different, but what I can also say is that if there's a will, every conflict can be solved. No, nobody in Colombia uh, ten, year, 10 years ago imagined that the FARC would be giving up their arms, their arms destroyed, and they would become part of the Congress, which is reality today. Thank you. Another very, very different topic now um, relating to rebellion and, and protests here has been the issue of climate, um, climate change. And how do you, when you already have so many priorities, how do you then think of concrete actions and the relative importance of climate change on the political agenda? Well, peace processes uh, divide in like two phases. One is 
peacemaking. And the other word is peace building. Peacemaking is when you sign the agreement, the guerrillas give up their arms, and uh, you have uh, the transition from uh, guerrillas to civil and social life. But peace building uh, means reconciliation. I'll tell you an anecdote with the Pope. The Pope was one of the uh, supporters of this peace process, and I used to go and visit him. And I used to tell him, uh, Pope uh, Francis, why don't you go to Colombia and give me a hand? This is very difficult. And he said, you know, I, I pray a lot. Uh, I, I, pray, uh, I pray for you a lot. And I said, Ooh, if, you pray, if you pray a lot for me, that means I'm in big trouble. <laughs> no? uh, why don't you go to Colombia? And I said, I will go when you will most need me. And uh, he went in a marvelous visit after I signed the peace agreement. And he put the title of his visit. I come to Colombia to push the Colombians to take the first step in a very long road of reconciliation. And that takes time. He, uh, the, the wounds that are opened after 50 years of war take time to heal. But one of the, one of the reconciliations is also with the environment. And I said, we need to reconcile with the environment because I also had a very personal experience. I, when I started my government back in 2010, more or less it coincided with the worst Niña phenomenon. Uh, that's when the Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, the temperature changes and rain pours and we were virtually flooded in Colombia for about two years. The worst Niña that we had ever, we, we are a very vulnerable country to climate change. And we, are, at the same time, have a very rich biodiversity. As a matter of fact, they say that we are the richest country in the whole world in terms of biodiversity per square kilometer, where biodiversity is more concentrated. Uh, so that experience also forced me to do a complete uh, overhaul in our uh, environmental policies. My predecessor um, was one of the persons who thought that climate change did not exist, and so he did away with the Ministry of the Environment. I reestablished the Ministry of the Environment and put a very, very high uh, goals, objectives. Aim high. That's another, another uh, advice I give any a student in the government. Aim high, be very ambitious in your, in your uh, objectives. Um, and in the case of, of, uh, of the environment, I said, we are going to protect at least 20% of our territory. Um, we're going to limit something that Colombia has, which no other country has in the world. We have some ecosystems very high in the mountains. They're special ecosystems which are only present in the Andes Mountains. And they are virtual fabrics, factories of water. They're called paramos. There's no translation into English. It's the, the closest highlands. It's like wetlands, but highlands. 70% of our water come from the paramos. But we lived in Colombia like this was something normal. And slowly, agriculture and mining were destroying these paramos. We have 37, 50% of the paramos of the world are in Colombia. So we decided to limit them and protect them. Now, they're all protected. There's no mining, no agricultural activity in, in these paramos. And the Amazon and also our oceans, especially there's an island called Malpelo, which is very rich in terms of biodiversity and fauna and flora in marine. And so I, 
I uh, received the country with 12 million hectares protected, and I gave to my successor a country with 43 million, more than 20 percent. We, we achieved the objective. Um, the only problem right now that we have, big problem that we have to, is that peace is allowing um, the, I would say, the mafias that uh, are present to continue deforestation of the Amazon uh, tropical jungle. That we must stop. You saw, you all saw the report yesterday of the UN, what we're doing with the world. And so I think that Colombia, that we have been very much committed to this issue. We were the ones, uh, and this is a, a, a very uh, marvelous anecdote. A, a, a woman of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came to me in the year 2011 and said to me, President, I have a good idea for you to become uh, a leader in, in a very important issue that is confronting the world. And I said, what issue? that the Millennium Goals are going to end in the year 2015, and uh, we have this idea of setting some new goals, but with the environmental component, and the responsibility cannot be only in the shoulders of the developing countries. The developed countries should also be responsible. And I said, I like your idea. What a good idea. Why don't you write a memo? You know, I, I like short memos. I said, here it is. And she gave it to me. And I read it, very well uh, written. And I told my Ministry of Foreign Affairs, this idea I like. Uh, why don't you start building a, a support? And I went personally to the Rio uh, Plus 20 Summit back in the year 2012. And made the official proposal of the SDGs, and that's how the SDGs started. Uh, immediately, China that was uh, chairing the, the, the meeting said this is a great idea. The UK uh, participated very actively, and we started the negotiation with how many. We ended up with 17, and they became the agenda of the world in the year 2015. But following on the SDGs, there's 17 goals, there are 169 targets, and you talked earlier about the need to rally public opinion to be very clear, and you're a journalist. And I think one thing that strikes one listening to you is that these are complex and nuanced problems, but you have a very clear tag on them and way of articulating them. So how do you take the SDGs, which are so all-encompassing, and, and try to prioritize or to focus? Well, if, if, you, if you get the, the list of items in each uh, objective, um, you will go crazy. Too many. And even, even when we were discussing the 17, I remember that we were uh, there and uh, somebody from Scandinavia uh, came and said, said to me and to us, uh, you're doing this in the wrong way. And I said, why? Too many objectives. When you have too many, uh, this will, will not work. And you are, you're not prioritizing what is really important. And I said, why do you say that? And he asked me, what do you think is the most effective investment to uh, maintain the environment of the world, of the planet. And I said, planting trees. And he said, no, that's number two. Number one, 10 times more important. He had, I don't know, calculated, 10 times more effective is to maintain the coral reefs that has a much uh, more important effect for the world planet than the trees. I, I had no idea. 
but we did incorporate that in one of the objectives. But uh, what, what did we do in Colombia? We uh, said to each minister that was in charge of each ob objective, choose one, one objective of the all those items, sub-items that are in each objective, choose one and uh, concentrate on fulfilling that one. And maybe that will help with the others. But don't go after everything because then uh, you probably won't fulfill any of the objectives. So last question, um, and I'll do two, and you can choose which one, but um, Rolf Edberg, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize for Dag Hammarskjöld, said no one around him could help noticing that he had a room of quiet with him. So a question for you is, in all of this confrontation, difficult times, it's not all been easy, where do you go to renew yourself? And relatedly, this is a school of public policy, and what are the qualities that you think people here, you hope that they learn here, or that they cultivate in themselves to go forward? Well, the inner strength, uh, well, Again, another anecdote which is very elusive. At the beginning of the process, a professor of leadership from the Harvard Kennedy School uh, went to me and said, you are embarking in a very, very difficult road and uh, you will encounter a lot of obstacles and difficult moments and you will be willing to throw in the towel many times. My advice for you to re-energize is talk to the victims. Ask them about their lives, the dramas that they went through. And so I did. And I started talking to the victims. Um, and uh, the dramas that uh, they told me were so uh, impressive uh, that I went out of those conversations uh, uh, full of energy. You know, I'm, and they, they even told me, persevere, you must continue. Um, we have, uh, uh, I thought that the victims were going to be the most uh, strong or not, not strong, that, that they, would be, they would oppose any transitional justice, any benevolence to the perpetrators. And they taught me the contrary. Uh, their generosity was for me a tremendous surprise and tremendous, uh, a tremendous lesson. I have one of the victims is here, Ingrid Betancourt, six years kidnapped by the FARC in the middle of the jungle. And she has been one of the most and I, I, thank, I, I have no words to thank her, uh, most supportive of the peace process. Uh, she could have been very mad at these people who tortured her, who mistreated her for six years, and she's been one of the most willing for the transitional justice to apply to them. This is a lesson of life. But there, there's a word for any of you who are going to be and you are probably leaders, or going to be leaders, uh, which is very important. Empathy. To put in, the sh to feel the pain of the people, to feel their concerns, to feel uh, their their confusions, their anxieties, to understand them. Uh, that will make you a better person. Definitely, I made me a better person to hear to these victims but will allow you to take decisions in a much more convincing way, convincing for them, for the people. That is a lesson I, I think I, I would underline. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I wonder if we can now move to your questions. I'm very aware that we have sitting here in the front row, Malcolm Dees, um, Britain's foremost historian of Colombia. And Malcolm, I'm sure you've got a question for President Santos, and I can't guarantee it will be an easy one. <laughs> We've got Eduardo Posado um, um, 
from the Latin American Studies Center here in Oxford, Colombian, and like the president, a former journalist and now academic. So um, you don't have to be a professor to ask a question, but I'm giving you a moment to think of your top question, and I'll take these two first and then come to everybody, including you, sir. Yeah. Yes, I don't actually have a question, but I have a sort of footnote comment which I think is relevant to the Blavatnik and to the School of Government and to academia. And uh, to a couple of comments. One is that I find it, uh, I'm very proud of the contribution that some of our former students made to your government. Mm -hmm. um, the one who perhaps contributed most was actually the student of classics. But we can forget that for the moment because in his later reading, he expanded very much from that. But I think the way in which the whole process showed that an academic input of an experienced type was very important is something that I would, sorry, just like to emphasize a bit of. The second thing was I would like to sort of, I very usually have a fairly dim view of British diplomacy in Latin America. There are exceptions. The exceptions that occurred in my mind, the first one is Mrs. Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher was the first British Prime Minister who ever read a dispatch from Bogota, as far as I can tell. She supported President Barker against the Narcos in a very timely and effective fashion. And I think also, as I, we've talked about, Tony Blair's support was important. And it's nice to be able to recognize that some, sometimes, despite Brexit and everything else, this country does make a significant dif difference. This is not to any way diminish the essential Colombian nature of the whole effort or to diminish the tactful assistance of the United States. But it's something which I think is interesting for the school that, that you know, when one looks at the Blavatnik School of Government, old cynics like myself say, we ask ourselves, do these people know anything about governing? And sometimes some of them do. And I think also interesting what you said about your own academic formation in the LSE with Sen and here and how that has continued. I do notice a very substantial academic input in thinking of President Santos. Can I, can I add to that question for the benefit of the Master of Public Policy students here? Because as Malcolm says, you did study and then you studied at the Kennedy School. Um, did you learn anything useful? in your MPA before you embarked on being president. <laughs> are there, now here's the question a teacher would ask, are there things you wished that you had spent more time focusing on that you were taught? And were there things that you should have been taught that you weren't taught? Okay, uh, let me make a comment on, on British Columbia. Uh, when, I, when I learned how to sail, back in that, that was 1969, I was in the Navy. I learned also how to play the bagpipe because the <laughs> British, the British founded our, our Navy and uh, there was an anniversary of the uh, Navy and the British Embassy uh, gave the Navy 10 bagpipes and a Scottish professor. And I was a recruit and, uh, and well, who looks like Scottish and come here. And, and they taught me how to uh, play the bagpipe. <laughs> well, many, many years later, that was in 2016, I was the first president in 200 years of relations with Great Britain that came uh, in a state visit. And uh, when I entered the banquet in Buckingham Palace, where I was staying, proudly enough, uh, there were 85 bagpipers that the Queen had brought from Scotland because she knew that I had played the bagpipe uh, 40 years before. Wow. The first British Prime Minister to s touch Latin America was John Major because Colombia had helped the UK, had uh, supported the UK in the Falklands War. Uh, and uh, I must say that 
two of the, of the five advisors that I had were British. And what uh, Tony Blair helped in terms of intelligence was absolutely fundamental in the turning point to, to have one of the conditions that were necessary to bring the FARC to the negotiating table. So there's a lot that I am grateful for in the help that the British uh, gave us. And also something very important. The British uh, also helped me and helped the Colombian Armed Forces to regain something that we had lost, legitimacy by teaching them the importance of human rights in war, which is, may, may be a contradiction, but it's, it's something very important. The rules of the game, international humanitarian law, and that also helped us to be effective. Now, I must say that it, my MPA was very useful. My first uh, negotiation techniques I learned in, in my MPA at, at Harvard. A marvelous professor called Roger Fisher, I remember. Uh, there was a, uh, a, less, uh, a course that I took that you, you probably met him, Richard Neustadt mm -hmm. and Ernest May. Taking him time. The uses of history. And that helped me a lot to, to analyze other peace processes and what could be applicable to Colombia and what not. We studied 17 peace process uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, professor, Robert Reich, he was the labor minister of, of Clinton. Uh, the social component of, and they, he, said, he, he, he said, never forget the social component of any public policy. Uh, this is extremely important, and that I learned. So I, I learned a lot uh, uh, that I, uh, during the MPA that I used throughout my, my, uh, my career. I had as a teacher, uh, former candidate and governor of Massachusetts, Dukakis, mm -hmm. who was my teacher, and he, he taught me the relations between politics uh, and public policy, which n not uh, every time is very clear. Mm -hmm. How to use politics to influence public policy and how to use public policy to influence politics. Mm -hmm. That interrelationship is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I take sort of two or three comments at once so we can give people a chance? Um, so over there, right against the wall, yep. We'll take, keep them brief and we'll take three. Um, thank you for a very informative lecture. Um, you mentioned that you left Colombia with millions more hectares of protected areas. Um, but you also alluded to what is in fact a six-fold increase in forest fires in some of these areas. So I was wondering, given the importance of the Amazon and tree cover to long-term sustainable economic development, what do you think is the best way that post-conflict Colombia can address a stronger, more effective protection of the environment? Who else has a question on the environment? Just on the environment. Are there any others? Yeah, can we take these, these two here? Thank you very much for the lecture. It was very interesting. Um, my question is about the Paramos, which you spoke about, and also about foreign investment, which you also spoke about. Um, and I'm interested to hear what you think about the interaction between the two and recent cases uh, concerning mining in the Paramos and its prohibition. Um, how would you comment on the development of these cases and what, what do you think the results might be from that? Thank you very much. I guess my question also complements the other two. Um, how do you identify and manage effectively 
potential trade-offs between different policy objectives, such as between biodiversity conservation and development, or justice and reconciliation. Okay, I'll, I'll try to address the, the, the three. There's always a trade-off. Every decision that you take has a cost. Um, I remember, I think it was uh, De Gaulle who said, the art of governing is uh, uh, choosing among many decisions the lesser evil. Um, but you then have to prioritize. You have to, you have to have priorities. I believe today that the number one priority for the world, for all of you, is to stop the global warming. Uh, there's no more important objective uh, because we were able, we've been able back in when I was at the at, at the MPA at that time is to stop nuclear war. Well, nuclear war is still a possibility, but it's only a possibility. Climate change is a certainty. We already have it, and to stop the warming is. I think the most important objective. In the case of Colombia, uh, what is the, the uh, reason why the deforestation has continued? It's uh, because uh, lack of territorial control. I think the government needs to have uh, a much more effective territorial control um, and stop uh, the uh, advance of the agricultural frontier. We did in Colombia, we put a limit. Uh, of a, we demarcated the frontier to the left and to the right, and we left 44 million hectares to be uh, produced, and from, from those uh, uh, frontiers, no agricultural activity and no mining activity unless it's very much controlled. Um, you need to have much more effectiveness in enforcing those boundaries like you, the, the way you protect your, your, your frontier from Venezuela or from Ecuador, you should also protect the frontier. One of the ways that we uh, did this which is very effective, but we did not have enough, enough uh, people, was to put the indigenous people right in the frontier. They are the best guardians of the environment. Uh, and, the, 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 and they know better than any of us the value of maintaining the forest and the biodiversity. Uh, we have a park which they say is the most important park in the world in terms of biodiversity, the park of Chiribiquete. What we did is I gave the indigenous people there, uh, the called the Huitotos, 600,000 hectares in the boundaries, but that was not enough. Uh, we need to protect, to protect them more. Now, what is the foreign investment, the mining companies in the Paramos. Uh, well, in, in theory, nobody can mine within the limits. However, we are a country of laws. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, these laws are uh, uh, good laws, others are not very good laws. But we try to respect the rule of law. What happened in a couple of these paramos? That the mining companies had rights already uh, given to them to mine, uh, where we said afterwards you cannot mine here. So we have a legal problem with them, which we have to uh, uh, resolve in the courts um, and to see how we can compensate the, 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 the mining company or 
in a, in a specific case where it's right in the limit how the mining company can sacrifice part of the paramo that uh, has been delimited. It's, it's a typical situation of public policy of, of where uh, conflicting interest and generally you, you resolve that by going to the courts. Thank you. Next question. So coming to this side, yes, this lady. Sorry, this lady here. Thank you very much. Um, I was the British ambassador in Cuba uh, at a key point of the peace process you led. My question is how important was the role of Cuba in facilitating the peace negotiations? And I ask this uh, at a time when I'm quite shocked by the policy being pursued by the Trump administration, which I see as wholly counterproductive. Um, I, I'd be interested in your reflections. Other questions on the peace negotiations. So one right over there, very keen up in the bleachers, and one, sorry, down here, if we can bring the microphone to this, this lady here. Thank you. Hola, hola. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. President. I am Eduardo Lopez. I was with you, with Eduardo Posada, in an amazing conference in another um, school in another time, in, uh, many months ago in Oxford. Um, my question is that uh, I think you are uh, one of the best former minister or president uh, worldwide with a lot of knowledge with your mind. You study in in UK, in in United States. Uh, what is your uh, idea about uh, the solution from from Venezuela? Because uh, you speak with uh, uh, um, Antonio Gutierrez, your friends. I think the world needs a, a former president of ministers like you, uh, because Kissinger died. I think uh, you are uh, this mind for open mind, no? Because different uh, former president. Thank you. Thank you. And from the lady here. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is, and um, this may be. Uh, very sensible, sensitive question, but I cannot help myself but to ask. Uh, what, what are your feelings regarding the sustainability of the peace process now in Colombia? It's not, it's not sensitive, it's a very wise and important question. Now, I will try to answer the three questions. Cuba was very important. They helped a lot. They were interested in also, in a way, uh, cleaning their face with the world community uh, after being the promoters of the revolution, now they're peacemakers. And Obama understood that very well. And the peace process in Colombia helped to substantially improve the relations between the U.S. and Cuba to the extent that uh, they were in the right track until Trump came and back and, and simply reversed everything. Uh, it is unfortunate uh, because I think uh, uh, w the policy that uh, President Trump is using, to, using in, um, in Latin America is something that is completely counterproductive. There was a very good piece uh, in the New York Times today of the former ambassador of Obama uh, analyzing the Trump's foreign policy, uh, especially with Latin America. And when you have a foreign policy that is determined by your internal um, objectives, electoral objectives, you usually take the wrong decisions. In Venezuela, 
Venezuela is also suffering from that. Um, we tried, when we created the Lima Group, to maintain the U.S. in the back row, not in the forefront. The U.S. presence, especially in these type of situations, is usually counterproductive. We still have the phantom, especially when the President of the United States mentions that there's a possibility of a military intervention. That generates a lot of confusion and a lot of opposition. And in a way, you've seen the two uh, failures in the last months, the humanitarian aid, and just last week what happened. And that is bad planning, underestimated, underestimating Maduro, which he should go and should go fast, but I hope that he could go fast in a different way rather than a valid way. What is that different way? A golden bridge has to be um, has to be designed for him to go with a, in, in a peaceful way. And to build that golden bridge, you need the major stakeholders. And who are the major stakeholders? Russia, China, Cuba, the US, and Latin America. Um, I don't think it's difficult. Uh, but who can bring these stakeholders together? For example, the UN. But what happens right now, the US doesn't want the UN to participate. So we have to find a way or, and, and, and thank you very much for your generous words, but I'm the least person uh, to participate in that process because Mauro doesn't like me very much. So uh, I, don't, I don't think I will be uh, uh, contributing very much, but I think that this is the way out. And uh, the sustainability of the peace process. It's a good question because many people are asking what is going to happen to the peace process. Fortunately, this peace process was extremely ambitious, the most ambitious, the most comprehensive, comprehensive peace process ever negotiated. And I don't say this, the institutions that study the peace process say it. For example, there's an institute called the Krog Institute in the Uni University of Notre Dame who has a matrix of all the peace process and they say this is the most ambitious and comprehensive. What usually is negotiated in a peace process in the case of Colombia has already been fulfilled 100%. The guerrillas gave up their arms the arms were destroyed, they become a political party, and they've been incorporated into the, uh, into the society, uh, and uh, they're doing politics. But we went much further. We created a special system of justice, transitional justice. It's the first time ever that the two parties get together and design a very sophisticated way to guarantee that there will be no impunity for crimes against humanity and war crimes. And that transitional justice has been, uh, uh, the, the, some, some people, and the President Duque has tried to change that. Uh, that is a change in the agreement. The Congress just rejected that and the social justice will start working and there's no way, there's no way to stop that. The other great uh, uh, contribution um, that this agreement has uh, that is unprecedented is the 17 territorial plans to develop or to invest in the areas where the war was uh, present, uh, these areas that were uh, affected by the war. These plans were plans that, and that's the way we negotiated, uh, 
that were to be designed and decided by the communities themselves. They would prioritize the investment. Uh, and that would take two years, 2017 and 2018. We did a very, very uh, uh, cumbersome and difficult job of uh, trying to get the communities to, uh, to express themselves. They did um, more than 2,800 meetings. The plans are ready and they should start implementing this year. Some of them have started. So this process is irreversible. There's no way that uh, the guerrillas are going to go back to the mountain. We have some of them uh, already in drug trafficking, but this is a normal backlash of a process so complex, a guerrilla that was tainted with drug trafficking. And uh, we even have uh, as a percentage, a, a percentage lower than the average in peace processes that keep their arms or, or go back to, in this case, simple criminality. Great, three, three more questions. We've got loads of people asking. Can we, can we come down here to the front, front, front row over on the side? Hi, thank you so much for your uh, illuminating talk. I, um, we've heard you talk a lot about the past of your government and of the continent. I'd like to hear some words about the future. What do you see for the future of Latin America? Uh, you've mentioned a little bit about Venezuela. I come from Brazil. Uh, Brazil has a very peculiar situation at this moment. Do you see that spilling over to other countries in Latin America? When, how do you see the future of our continent? Thank if you. If you can pass the microphone just back to the man in the next row. No, um, just so you, yeah. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, you mentioned many vec vectors and many components. It's, for my view, it's important to build the process to achieve peace. And you also mentioned one personality, identity of you, that is very important, your ability to change your mind, very similar to our Prime Minister Rabin, <clears throat> that he was killed because he wanted to achieve peace. But uh, I think that uh, the most important, uh, from your personality, you didn't mention, the most difficult uh, to achieve peace it's the ability to create peace between enemies. And for this, you need to create, at the beginning, trust between two sides. And something in your personality have, have you the ability to do it. Maybe you can uh, let us to understand what is in your personality that you can create a trust between enemies. And then if you can pass it back to the gentleman behind you. Yeah. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Um, if there's one thing you could change about the way you handled the peace process, what would that be? And also, how would you apply some of the lessons you learned from your handling the peace process or the peace process in general to some conflicts that are happening today? Um. I will, I will start with uh, the question about trust, uh, and you're absolutely right. You don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. And uh, you need to build that trust. Um, Kissinger used to say a lot uh, on a negotiation techniques that you have to zoom in and zoom out. What does that mean? You have to understand the context of the negotiation and zoom in is understand the personalities. What are their, uh, who are they and what are they after? And from then, 
from there, you start identifying uh, trust building measures. Uh, for example, in my case, uh, I had been their worst enemy, but they respected me because of that. And uh, I had to make some very tough decisions and some very uh, benevolent decisions. For example, we negotiated secretly during, during two years. Um, and one of the negotiators of that agenda, which we negotiated with my older brother, the fact that I sent my brother to talk to them was a gesture of building trust. At the same time, I told them I would, I would apply the Rabin Doctrine. We would fight in the middle of the war. We would negotiate in the middle of the war. We would not have any uh, contemplation. And they would, should, should, not, have, uh, should ha not have any con contemplation with me. And I told them with these words, you can kill me. Uh, and uh, I will not regret it in the sense that I will be killed, but uh, my, my family will probably regret it, but it's part of the rules of the game. It's hard, but it's reality. And uh, I had to, some months later, to take the decision to do an operation against the number one, the commander of the guerrilla, with whom I had already started to interact. And I had this decision to, should I authorize the operation? I could blow up the peace process. Or if I didn't authorize the operation, I would lose a fundamental part of the uh, supporters of the peace process, which were my military. Difficult decision. But since I said to them, they could kill me with those words, at the same, at the same way I could kill the number one. And so I authorized the operation, and he was killed. Later on, they said that they respected me more for that very difficult decision because the rules of the game were those. So it's, it's a process of building trust, gaining confidence, and uh, at the end, I told, uh, before we, 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 end, we signed the peace agreement, I told the, the, the then commander, who's still the leader of the FARC, you must realize that uh, we are going to be on the same boat, defending what we're going to sign against very powerful voices that will criticize you and criticize me. And it's the same words that I recommend all of you to see a movie called The Voyage. It's about the Northern Ireland peace process. It's a conversation between Ian Paisley and McGuinness. At the very end, uh, one says to the other, do you realize that your people are going to hate you and my people are going to hate me for signing this peace? And the other one said yes. They shook hands and then went and sang the peace. So th th this is the type of situation you always encounter. In a peace process, nobody, I mean, you, you cannot have everybody happy. Always there's going to be from one side or another unhappy people. The future of uh, Latin America, I wish I had my, uh, <laughs> crystal ball. Crystal ball. Crystal ball. Um, we are in a, in, a, in a not very easy situation. We have populism of the right, like in your country, populism of the left, Mexico, the two biggest countries in Latin America. We have the Venezuela, situation which is, uh, couldn't be worse. 
We have a very difficult situation in Argentina. Nobody knows what, what's going to happen. The economy is, is, is not doing well, and this is affecting Macri's re-election. In today's polls, they say that Cristina is going to win again. Uh, Chile is doing quite right. It's OK. Ecuador, Ecuador is, uh, uh, is having trouble also. They have a big macroeconomic problem. Um, Colombia is doing, is doing OK, but also with some problems. So we, we are not uh, in, a, in the best position uh, at this time, uh, very dispersed, and uh, with a neighbor to our north, which is uh, not helping at all to try to mobilize uh, Latin America in the correct way. And the third question was, what do you do differently in the peace What I should, uh, what I do <laughs> differently? Um, well, when, when, you look, when you look back in your life, there's a, many things that you would do differently. For example, I'll give you an example. The peace process uh, is costly for many reasons that I don't want to get into, but politically, it's a very costly process. And so the more secret you can make the negotiations, the better. And uh, also the shorter, the better. And I, I took a decision that was contrary to that objective. The five points in the agenda, we decided to negotiate in sequence. We did not go to the second point unless we finished the first point. Instead of doing in a simultaneous way, that would have shortened the time of the negotiation. Uh, and so the negotiation extended in time too much, and that was very costly for the process. That's, for example, one, one thing that I would have done differently. Um, can I just say, there's always at one of at, at these talks in the school someone that approaches me usually a week later to explain to me that they're doing their doctorate about the person who was sitting on stage. So can I just say to whoever it is out there that's doing their doctorate about President Santos, please come and introduce yourself at the end. He's here for a few more days and you should actually speak to the protagonist. Um, where, where at time closure, and we began this discussion, President Santos, with you saying that your advice to everyone was to know where they're going, to know what their North Star is. You're now a man of huge wisdom and experience and a Nobel Peace Prize. So what's your North Star at the moment? Where are you heading now? My granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I decided. I took a decision uh, not to participate in local politics. This is something that in Latin America is not very, uh, very often uh, the case. Um, we like, uh, there's a, a terrible word called the caudillo. Mm -hmm. We love caudillos, the, those that think that they, they need, they, they, they have, they are indispensable. I think that has been bad for Latin America. And uh, so I decided not to interfere in politics. I, am, uh, I have a foundation that I created with the money of the Peace Prize, of the Nobel Peace Prize, that is helping to this reconciliation at the grassroots level in Colombia. It's helping on, we're going to work together with OFI on uh, promoting the use of the multidimensional index in other countries, and very much uh, working to see if we can help in any way possible to stop the global warming. Thank you very much. Um, could you join me in thanking both Sabina Kier, and she didn't talk about 
neither of you did, more about the multi-dimensional poverty index, but I would recommend that you all look at the wonderful work that Sabina has led for many years now and that President Santos has applied in country. And most of all, to thank President Santos, a man hugely in demand, and it's greatly um, to our wisdom and knowledge and learning that you come and share these thoughts with us. And I know I speak to everyone and saying we're hugely grateful, and we hope you'll come back soon. Thank you.